Okay, so for day two of our class, we're still doing some of the intro stuff. And again, as I said, that if you have experience in any of this web development stuff, it might be a little slow in the beginning because we need to cover basic aspects of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So if you have some experience in those items, you may see some of this already. And you may have more experience, more advanced experience in what we're going to talk about at this point, but definitely we will get intermediate to advanced levels, but first we'll do the basic levels. Today's big idea will be to focus more on CSS, which is the uh, the presentation layer of our app. Remember that we've got these three different layers, which I'll reiterate in a moment. Here's how we'll set ourselves up to work. Uh, if you brought your flash drive and you've saved your work there, you want to plug that in, if you didn't bring a flash drive, or if you want to use my work from last time, I'm going to put my work in the network folder. Let me remind you where the network folder is at. Everyone's computer should be on. On the top left corner, you can double click on computer. Go ahead and double click computer at the top left of your desktop. You will see a section of network location specifically Classroom Data Drive Z, as in Zebra. Network Location Classroom Drive Z, open Classroom Data Drive Z. Scroll down to find our class, which is Campus Android 1. Double-click Campus Android 1. And what's in there, if you were not here Tuesday, is the syllabus, the notes that I wrote, and the code that I wrote. If you were here on Tuesday, Again, all of the stuff that we worked on last time is here. And if you would like a copy of what I ended up with, there it is there, 2016-09-06 HTML. And the resume that we were working with. Notes that I wrote are 2016-09-06 text and the syllabus. So for, for today, if you are brand new for the class, to the class. You want to get a copy of Resume Example 2016-0906. If you were here on Tuesday, you can decide to use your copy of the resume that we coded, or you can use a copy of mine. So I'm going to get a copy of my work from Tuesday, and I'm going to copy it to my flash drive. I'm also going to put today's date on it. Usually what I do is I make a new version of the code so that there's a version at the end of the day every time and we can get back to an older version if we need to. So, little pause here. Did everyone get a copy of the resume HTML file? Anyone need a little help? So, I'm, I've copied that to my flash drive. You can't edit the one that's in the network folder. People do this often at the beginning. They see the file in the network folder and they start to edit it and they say, I can't, I can't save it. No, because it's locked. In my network folder, only I can add something to the network folder. So you cannot save anything there. You cannot edit my files. Make sure you get a copy of that onto your desktop or your flash drive. Preferably your flash drive because deep freeze will erase everything that you leave on our computer. If you look on the bottom right corner, you might see like a little uh, little polar bear staring at you. That's a deep freeze. It means the computer is locked. Anything you do to it will erase as soon as you restart the computer. That's good and bad. It's perhaps bad for you because if you left something on the desktop and you come back next time, it's gone. I didn't, I didn't erase it. Deep freeze did. It's good because what if someone gets a virus on a computer? All we do is restart the computer and the virus goes away. So make sure you get a copy of the work onto your flash drive or your Dropbox or Google Drive or whatever so that you can take it with you. All right, so I assume everyone has a copy of 2016-0908. Right-click it. Right-click your HTML file and select Edit with Notepad++. If it just says Edit, don't do that one. 
to right click edit with notepad plus plus again if you're comfortable more with brackets or sublime text or whatever else editor we have here uh, you may use that uh, but we're using notepad plus plus in this class so go ahead and open up your code in notepad plus plus we'll get started are there any empty seats left anywhere in the room with a computer so, did everyone get their code open in Notepad++? One quick thing, then we'll get started with our coding. There's so many code editors out there, they all have their pros and cons. Uh, I like Notepad++, as I said, because it's a quick, efficient editor. It's not an IDE, which is a whole integrated environment. This is just edit your code, run your code. That's it, not too complex. And um, it's configurable. We saw that we have this color coding for our different chunks of code or different tags. And that's very useful for, for coding because then we can tell where does this block of code start or end or this kind of code is this with this color and that kind of code has another color. And it's configurable. This default coding color scheme is not the best, especially if you're coding for long periods of time because right here we've got uh, a white background on the monitor shooting photons at your eye for three hours straight. So a bright white background is not the best background to code on. It's very tiring for our eyes. If you'd like to change that, you can go up to the settings menu and then we will see the style configurator. I don't think that's a real word, but go to settings style configurator and then we'll select it. We've got one seat left. You can go to Style Configurator, and we're currently in the theme of Default. You can go up here and change different ones. So you can go to the um, Obsidian theme and notice it gets darker. A darker background theme um, for your coding environment is actually a little bit easier on the eyes. It's not so much bright light aimed at your eyeballs for hours and hours of coding. So that's one you might consider. What else? Ruby blue, just another kind of color system, twilight. I like using Bespin. There's a bunch of ones there. So I'm going to keep it on the default one because that's most readable to you guys on the projector. But I would recommend to use any other theme since it's easier on the eyes, some more than others. There's classic Vim. Whatever you like then, you can click Save and Close. I'm going to keep it on the default. Now, I do have to say, however, if you're a real coder, you need to pick Hello Kitty. <laughs> anyway, you can pick whichever one you want. And that's up in the style... That's up in the settings style configurator. All right, so we've got our document from last time. Remember our workflow is that in Notepad, we're going to write our code, be it HTML, CSS, or JavaScript, and then we're going to see the result in the web browser. So just to remind us what this looks like so far, go up to the Run menu and launch any web browser that you like. I'm just using Firefox. It's the first at the top. And notice they've all got a keyboard shortcut. Control Alt Shift X or Control Alt Shift I or R or F. So with practice, you'll be able to launch your browser with one hand. If you remember that keyboard shortcut, Shift Control Alt X, for example. I'm going to load my browser. Here's what I've got so far. We we're starting to construct a resume. We wrote the content and then we uh, added the HTML code for the um, presentation. So 
in addition to writing code, I'm going to be writing notes once in a while. And these notes I will save to the network folder at the end of the day. They will have the day's date. So we've got HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Briefly, HTML is the content layer. CSS is the presentation layer. JavaScript is the behavior layer. We mentioned that last time. And we worked pretty much with HTML last time. Notice what we created is not that visually interesting with plain old HTML. There are a few basic built-in presentation tags and attributes, but really we want to focus or prefer CSS for any presentation things. Colors, sizes of things, fonts, <coughs> alignment of elements and positioning, CSS. And then eventually when we want our website or app to do something, JavaScript. So that's why our document's pretty boring. I want to focus on CSS to start to add colors and font sizes or font colors and all of that cool stuff. When we get to CSS and JavaScript, then we have to decide when using CSS or JavaScript decide on which of the three ways to write our code, three methods. We have either the inline method, we have the embedded, embedded method, and we have the external method. Decide on one of those three, inline, embedded, or external for CSS or JavaScript. Since we're talking about JavaScript today, or CSS today, I'm going to focus on CSS. Inline CSS is writing code, writing CSS code directly on a tag, on an HTML tag. We can write CSS code directly on a specific tag to change its default behavior. Instead of black text, red text. Instead of white background, a yellow background. Instead of 12-point font, 72-point font. We can write the CSS directly on the tag. Embedded, write CSS in the HTML document in the head section. I can embed, I can write all of my lines of CSS in one central location in my HTML file, in the head of the HTML document. And then I've got external, write CSS in its own file, a .css file. Write CSS in its own file and link to the HTML file. And this applies to JavaScript as well. When we get to it, we can write JavaScript directly on a tag, basically. We can write it in a, in a little block area of our HTML file. This one's actually down in the body, usually. Uh, or external, a .js file that includes all of our JavaScript code in one central location. None of these is right or wrong for every instance, although I'll tell you which are the preferred ways, because I'll write some pros and cons here. Um, so inline, embedded, external, pro, con, positive or negative. A pro of inline, it's quick and easy and direct. I can write my specific CSS or JavaScript code on a specific tag, and it does it at that point, and it's done. The con is harder to maintain, harder to update our code in the future, and not, let's say, universal. That'll make more sense in a moment, universal. 
but doing it in line is a quick easy way to get the job done. It's, it's going to be harder in the long term as we'll see why contrasting with the other two. Embedded pro is um, this is I should put it in quotes universal doing it embedded is universal it's consolidated it's consolidated it's the opposite of inline in that you've got CSS code strewn all over your 200 lines of HTML code whereas embedded it's all in one section up at the head it's your first 20 lines of code, let's say. So it's easy to get back to it and edit it. It's in one location. A big con about that is only applies to one document at a time. One HTML document. Right now, it doesn't matter because we've got one file, resume.html. But if we had a full-featured website, we might have home.html, resume.html, about.html, etc. And therefore, three files. And if I write my embedded code in the home HTML file, it's only applying to the home HTML file. It's not applying or accessible by the about HTML file or the resume HTML file. It's only applied and accessible by one document. That could be a big con. External shares that it's universal and consolidated in one file, and it can apply to multiple documents. I can write all my CSS code in one file. I'm going to write all my CSS or JavaScript script code in this file, and then I'm going to link this file to this HTML file and this HTML file. They're linked. So the cool thing about that is if I make a change to the CSS file here, the changes automatically trickle down to these HTML files, as long as they're connected. If I'm writing embedded or inline and I make changes to this file, only this file changes and not this one or other files. And the con of that have to um, have to link the file, the, the dot CSS file to the many dot HTML files. If you've got many HTML files, you have to uh, take the time to link that CSS or JS file to all your HTML files in order for this to work. And therefore, if your CSS or JS file gets corrupted or disappears for some reason, every other file linked to it then loses that styling or JavaScript. Yes? Yes, uh, so when you embed it, uh, when you do like, uh, so like on part, can you just like save and like save that code as a different document and apply to it? Yeah, you can save it into a different document and then copy and paste it to apply it to multiple documents. But you're already one step closer to just doing it externally. If you're already saving your CSS code in a different file to use it elsewhere, just save it as a .css file and link it to every file you need and therefore you have external. So they all have their pros and cons. This is the one that is the most recommended. You want to have external CSS or JavaScript files. And we will be dabbling with inline and embedded. Uh, and those methods work, but really it's recommended to go external. Not just my recommendation. Every class and tutorial and book you're going to read is usually going to tell you recommendation is external. CSS or .js files. One thing that's a little hard to, harder to explain also at the moment about why you would want to do this is known as the um, known as the uh, order of precedence which takes over because later on we'll see let's make our background red. 
but then we're going to write some more code that says, let's make our background yellow. We're going to write two exact lines of code. One says background red, one says background yellow. Well, which takes over? That's the order of precedence, and we will see in detail which takes over. Uh, so this order here also, this type, the way you write your code also matters later on and how does the code get applied to the document. It'll make sense when we do it, so I won't quite get to it yet. But that's our idea for the moment. Now that we're going to deal with CSS and JS, we have to decide which of these. For the moment, we'll do one or two quickly and in line, and then we'll do it embedded and then external. Any questions so far? All right, let's write a little bit of, in, of inline CSS. Right now, my document is pretty boring. I would like for my name here to look more interesting in a different color. I want to change the color of my text. So as I said, inline is applied directly to a tag. If you go to line 9, line 9, we see that we've got the heading 1 tag that marks my name as a heading 1. I want to change the default behavior of heading 1, which is currently black text. I want a different color text. So this is going to be an attribute, just like we've seen the car set attribute, the href attribute. We have an attribute that we can apply to every tag called style, and that basically means CSS. We're going to change the style of a, of a particular element, style attribute. And then we have the actual properties and values. Okay, the property uh, that I'm going to change of heading 1 is the color of the text. So we'll write color, colon, space. Here we'll pick a color. Let's start with red. And then semicolon. The syntax is we have some property that we are affecting. And how are we affecting it? The value, property value of the attribute style. So heading 1, I'm going to change the color of the text to red. There's a colon right there. Space is optional, but I add a space there to be able to read it. And then the end of that statement or command, so to speak, is a semicolon. Save it and run it. You should then very easily and quickly see that now you don't have such boring color, red color. I chose red. We have other colors. Why don't you go back and instead try yellow, or purple, or blue, pink. Try different colors here. Try, you know, uh, purple it becomes purple. You can try uh, blue becomes blue. Pretty straightforward. We have a variety of colors to choose from. Although there are, of course, an infinite number of colors, but there aren't an infinite number of color names. Let's say I try gold. Let's see, gold color. It looks yellow to me, but okay, that's gold. It doesn't shine, but that's gold. If there's gold, is there silver? I'll try silver. It looks gray to me, but that's silver. Is there bronze? <coughs> No, there's no bronze. Once we hit on a hit upon a color name that doesn't exist, it just ignores it and it goes back to the default. Um, black. So there's a lot of names here that you wouldn't even think are, are color names or to think about them. There's crimson. You might have heard of that color, but there's crimson. There's azure. Azure, however you say it. It's a very, very, very light blue. Can't, you almost can't see it on my screen, but Azure is a very light blue. A lot of weird ones, actually. Here's one. Bisque. What color do you think bisque is? First of all, what's bisque? Bisque is a soup, isn't it? Now, is that lobster bisque or what? Yes. Mine's not changing color. Let's take a look. So try different colors, see if you can find colors that don't exist, or a color that you didn't think exists.
So different colors, we can do different colors, some really weird ones. Um, here's one, Alice Blue. So I suppose from Alice in Wonderland. It looks like Azure to me, but it's a slightly different version. As a matter of fact, so when these colors were being developed, someone was a fan, and we've got Dodger Blue. There we go. Yes? For the color names, there is no space. True. Um, and depending on the code, some of them might have a dash, but oftentimes, yes, it's just one name together. We'll see in JavaScript, the confusing part will be, Sometimes in JavaScript, our JavaScript code is one word, but you have to have specific capitalization for it to work. Here, everything's been lowercase so far, and if we write anything in uppercase, it'll work. But when we get to JavaScript, there will be a difference with capitalization that we have to memorize. Well, there's about 114 or 144 of these colors that we can look up, look a table, look up a table of. If you do a little detour and do a quick search for uh, CSS color names, you'll find plenty of websites out there that will have charts of all of these color names. I'm just choosing W3Schools. Remember, I mentioned that site last time. And so this is going to show you over here all 140 named colors, such as dim gray or dim gray. Fuchsia, light cyan. Now these are listed with capital letters and such, which is confusing, but really lowercase is what you want. Just for readability, they wrote medium aquamarine, which is that color there. But lowercase is what we're going with. So if I wanted medium violet red, Medium violet red. Medium violet red. Now, that's only 140 colors. And my company color is not any of these reds that I'm finding here. I need, therefore, to use a color formula. Let's try this. You added some kind of color to H1. Let's say for fun, we then also want to add a different color to our address block. A different color of text for our address block. Same concept, inline CSS. Let's go to line 10, and we're going to add the style attribute, which is style equals quote, end quote. Once again, the color property, space, and this time I want to write a color but in a color formula. I want to mix colors just like if I go to Home Depot or Lowe's and I'm gonna paint my house and I want a specific color I have them mix a color based on a formula mixing a little yellow, a little red, whatever. So we're gonna mix a color formula right here. First we'll type RGB open close parentheses semicolon. So here we will mix units of red, green, and blue color, going from a scale of 
0 to 255. So if I put 100 units of red, comma, space, uh, 25 units of green, comma, space, and 0 units of blue in this order. RGB, red, green, blue. 100 red, 25 green, 0 blue. It goes from 0 to 255. Based on that, we can make like 16 million colors or something like that. So uh, if I check my result, save your work, and if you check your result, it's a slightly different kind of pinkish, purplish color company color right there. Let's say I want to increase the red, so I'll take it all the way up to 220. Oh, sorry, I was distracted. Okay. It's right here. It was a very, very weak, it was a dark red. It almost looked black comparatively, but there is some pigment. As I increased my, my red units up here up to like 220, there we go, and I'm starting to see a red. If I say no green but full red, 255, it's a very bright red. full red and full blue, all the way up to 255, I'm getting a purple, magenta kind of color, and then all the way up to full green, 255, 255, white. So full-blown red, green and blue is white. Oppositely, no red, no green, no blue, black. So we can mix any color here, basically. And if you know hexadecimal colors, we can apply them as well. That's just another way to specify our, our color. If you do take a detour over to the W3Schools color chart here, you will see uh, a color like light cyan and then a color formula in a different way than we've written. This is another way to write colors in hexadecimal. You can go here and look at shades and, and mix a color. So if I have a if I have a color, it's giving it to me here. It's RGB 224, 255, 255. So colors can be expressed in a variety of ways. You know, red, if you go to Home Depot and you say, I want to paint my bedroom red, they're going to say, well, which red? We've got 70, <coughs> 70 shades of red, because you add a little bit more blue, or you add a little bit more yellow, and it's a brand new color. So in, in our projects, in our web apps and mobile apps, we can express our colors in hex or RGB, not HSL, I believe, but we can do hex, RGB, or the named color which there are only 140 to choose from. <coughs> so we've been writing a little bit of inline CSS. And we've edited one property of, of, our, of our code here. Let's say we'll go over to the objective heading, and we'll change the text color again, but we'll also change a second property. Uh, let's find objective, which is on line 24. Style attribute, color property. Let's say I'm going to choose um, brown, semicolon. We've been writing this semicolon because it ends the statement, color brown. 
And also we use it as a divider for more properties because I can control more than one property, such as a background color. I want to now change also the background color of the word objective. So after the semicolon, still within the quotes, and notice in my default style theme, my attributes here of CSS are in yellow. If yours are a different color, if any of your code, if you've got my theme and your code is different, that's one way to tell perhaps you wrote the code wrong. You know, if you misspell, uh, if you misspell style, notice style is not red like it is on mine because it didn't recognize what styly is. It recognizes style. And so within within the style attribute semicolon, we'll add another property semicolon, space, background, dash, color. Here's the spot where the, the words are not run together and they're in dashes. We're going to see via CSS, oftentimes things that have more than one word have a dash between them. The syntax is the same though, colon, space, plus a color. Let's say pink, semicolon, end of statement result, background color. If it didn't work, double check your spelling. Make sure you're typing it in the right place. And your style attribute. Yes? Because sometimes when you're typing, it like gets rid of the rest of the line you're typing. You know, the line's doing that. In the browser? No, in the what might happen here is, for example, I'm starting to write my, my tag, and I started with the opening quote, and I'm writing my code, and it all kind of changes color? Is that what you mean? It changes color, and it gets rid of the rest of the line that you're writing on. Oh, is it overwriting whatever you've written on top of? Um, Let me take a quick look. Uh, because you, would, you would say it might be the insert. Yeah, it might, be, it might have it on overwrite. This was a good point, actually. Uh, sometimes, accidentally, we may change the mode that we're writing our code. We've got overwrite or insert mode, and this is what we mean here. Uh, if I'm in the wrong mode, what's, what could happen is, uh, let's say I wanted to add a brand new property right here, uh, and I start to add the property of um, you know font size. Whoops, see how I'm starting to write on top of my existing code? I'm in my overwrite mode overwrite mode. And that happens on your keyboard, you might easily hit the insert key. Notice if I hit insert, the corner says insert. This is my regular mode where I'm inserting and it pushes my code to the side. Normal. If I do insert mode and it says overwrite down there, whatever I write is going to replace whatever was there. This often happens to us, so be careful about that. Make sure you're in insert mode. All right, so we added the uh, color property and the background color property. And the syntax of CSS as we separate these property names with a dash. There we go, background color. Depending on how you, you've got the size of your browser, I have it side by side here, but if you have it full screen like that, notice that pink color goes all the way to the edge of the screen that's the default as well. I never specified how much color to show. So it took up as much space as it, as it wanted. We can specify all of that. We can control all of that with CSS. Um, similar how we control the size of that picture. We, uh, we specified what property of the picture to shrink it like this. width or height. We specify the width or height of the picture to change it. We can specify width or height of these elements as well. 
Um, let's say here, furthermore, we'll add another property. I don't want that pink color to go all the way to the edge. I only want it to go a few pixels. So h2 style color, background color, new property, so semicolon. We need the semicolons to separate the property. One property, another property, a third property, which will be width. W-I-D-T-H, width, like width and height, colon, space. And here I'll say units, I'll say a value and units. Let's try first uh, 360 px, semicolon. px is pixels, dots on the screen, 360 dots. So the width, it looks like we specified the width of the background color to be 360. Let me write some notes here. CSS uses the box model. Every element on screen, like HTML elements, is bound by a box, by an invisible box. Everything that we've written is in a box, an invisible box. And <clears throat> specifically, each box has a top side, right side, bottom side, and left side, obvious. Top, right, bottom, left. I wrote it in this order because this is the order that matters when we write our code for styling um, CSS because we can do some cool tricks. You might have seen uh, websites and such that have, like, for example, on the left side of some text, only on the left side a little splash of color. And that's because we can write code to target only the left side of an element. Every element of the tag is bound by a box, so if we know the code, we can write something like uh, border left or left border or some code for the left side so that we have a color only on the left side and a different color on the other sides. And I bring it up at the moment because this width then is changing the size of the default box. Not that it's really changing the background color per se, it's changing the size of the box that the objective text is inside of. And this will make more sense and, and be more important later when we have more complex elements, like we want to put a left column and a right column, and we want to align things next to each other. We have to deal with these invisible boxes that exist and how do I put them together like a like a puzzle piece? This width that we wrote here in pixels is 360 pixels and it stays that size at all times. If I have some sort of project, let's say mobile app, that is defined like this. Yeah, I've got my browser tall and thin like a, like a tablet, let's say. And I've defined my size of my color here, my box, to be 360 pixels. Well, it might look nice on that size screen, like this one, but then someone downloads my app with this size screen, and now the 360 pixels is too small on this screen. 360 pixels on this screen looks good, but 360 is too small here. Uh, or vice versa. Someone else um, that, uh, has an even older device than this, and 360 is too big and it goes off the edge of the screen. So what I'm getting at here is that, depending on what we're doing, units like this matter. Right now I've chosen pixels, which are dots on the screen. And we have the units of inches. I can do 360 inches. That'll probably look really weird. Yep, see how my screen is going off to the edge and the edge and the edge? 360 inches, there we go. 
But a unit like inches doesn't make sense for digital projects because even if I put one inch, make the width of that one inch, if I take out a ruler and put it up on my projector, that's not an inch. This is approximately an inch on my thumb. If I'm looking at it on my screen here, it's a little bit more than my thumb. And if I'm looking at it on my device, probably my thumb is too big. So that's another unit that doesn't, isn't quite the best to use digitally. We have these other units, such as 100%. The percent unit might be a much better unit to use, because that will grow and shrink depending on the size of the monitor. So try this. Put 50% instead of 360 pixels. <coughs> and if you stretch your browser out, this will always be 50% of the width of the browser. So we'll be seeing various <coughs> units that are either um, relative units or absolute units. CSS often uses absolute or relative units. Favor relative units. Try to use relative units as much as possible. <laughs> because eventually when we make apps, and even now it matters, but when we make apps, there's going to be different size monitors, different size screens and devices. 4-inch, 5-inch, 7-inch tablets. And if we're using relative measurements, like when we talk about fonts, 12 points in Microsoft Word looks great when you print it out, because 12 points looks great on a printout, the printout doesn't change, but 12 points on this screen right here might look okay, and on this screen might look too tiny and hard to read. So we'll have units that we can use for fonts when we get to that eventually. And it's going to be a relative unit. Okay, so we've been changing some aspects, color, we're seeing here, uh, width, we'll be talking, this is all inline, we'll look at embedded and external in a bit, we'll do one more thing, then we'll take a break. Uh, these, well, let's back up like this, just for your information, HTML was invented in around 1989. CSS was invented in around 1998, I think, maybe 96, let's say 96. Uh, and JavaScript was invented in 1994, I believe. We can look these up. And so these technologies, if you go back to HTML, 27 years ago. And then years later, a way to make it look nice. Way too much later, a way to make it look nice. For a long time, web designers were, were very jealous of graphic designers um, because they were able to design their, their projects much, much better. So in short, a graphic designer, someone that deals with, with graphics or often physical graphics, like someone designed this physical object knowing that it was going to be two inches by one inch, therefore this logo can safely be one inch, and this font can safely be 12 points. A graphic designer, they feel, deal with physical things often. Us, web, and app designers, we don't have physical units really to work with. Yes, this is a 4-inch screen and this is a 5-inch uh, screen, but this is a 1080p HD quality screen and this is not. And therefore, one inch is not the same as this as on this. So based on the units that we use and the technology that we use and the code that we write, we can create 
content and projects that look the best for, for everyone. And CSS has been around a while, um, about 20 years, if it's 96, it might be 98. And um, that has evolved as well. HTML has evolved from 1.0, and we've got the latest one, 5.0, HTML5. CSS has evolved too, and right now it's at CSS3. So everything that we've been writing so far of CSS, however, has been plain old basic CSS1, uh, technically CSS2.2. Let's play a little bit with the newest and most interesting and coolest CSS3. We can use CSS3 to make some interesting effects that were pretty difficult in the old days. For example, I would like to add a drop shadow to this box of color right here. In the old days, I'd have to break out Photoshop and design some transparent graphics and build a table and all this complexity. Now with CSS3, we can write a simple uh, CSS property, and it does it. The property is going to be after your width. We've got box dash shadow colon. We have property value, property value, property value, property value. But some of these CSS rules, some of these CSS properties have much more complex value. With a drop shadow, we have to define a few things. So for the moment, let's just write this, then I'll explain it. Let's write 5px space, 5px space, 5px space, and black, semicolon. All four of these values are related to the box shadow property. Notice the way I wrote it. This one does have to have a space between each of these which I'll explain what they are in a moment. But save it and run it. Ooh, drop shadow. All of these values here are related to how are we defining our drop shadow. The first is the x offset. If I were to increase this to, to a higher number 15, notice it pushed my drop shadow over to the right a little bit more. There's 5, there's 15. It pushed it over more units to the right. This is the x offset. x is left and right. The next is the Y offset, which is up and down. Let's say I'll make it more dramatic, 25 px. It push that down further, 25 units. The next one is the blur. How blurry is the edge of the drop shadow? Let me take this one down to one pixel. Notice the edge is sharper. So put it up to If it was back on 5, notice it's blurry. If I put it on 1, it's sharp. And then the fourth one should make sense. That's the color of the drop shadow. And I can put any color there. Yellow. So X, Y, blur, and color. So I can move it to the right and I can move it down. Moving it to the right with x makes sense. Positive values make sense um, to move it to the right. If I wanted to move my shadow to the left, negative numbers. Negative 5 pixels is 5 to the left of the object. Yes? There's two values, so I mean, you don't indicate the, the, the uh, depth. Yes. 
No, we don't have a we don't have a we don't have a z. We only have x and y. We don't have a depth of z. Yeah, yeah, the blur is the third one. But what are these two values? These first two values are x and y. Yeah, but what if they didn't indicate what if do do they always indicate three values? Well, let me confirm. It should because it, I believe the specification needs needs it. Here it's x and y, and it took away, so I guess, the blur. Okay. The third value is the blur. I didn't specify it, so I guess I didn't blur it. If, is there is just one value? Nope, it gets confused. So it's often best to specify the three values. That way you have the most control. Instead of letting it do it for you and it doesn't do what, exactly what you want, it might be better to specify. If I want to move the shadow up, this is counterintuitive, but I would put negative numbers. You often think it's going up as positive, but actually this counts it negatively upward. Because the x and y comes from the origin of the top left corner of the element. So right there where my arrow is, that's 0, 0. 0x, zero 0y. Zero so negative 5 pixels is to the left of my arrow, and negative 5 pixels y is up above, which is negative numbers. It's not like the traditional coordinate plane of to the right is positive and up is positive. Here it's backwards because it's starting from the top left corner of the element. Positive values go to the right and down. And you could specify the origin, which is 0, 0. You don't really put units there because it's 0. But what that does is it keeps it on the object right behind it, and this is a way that I can kind of do interesting blur, like glowing effects on my uh, objects. This is how you can make like a button that you hover over and it glows. Don't specify, I mean specify, but don't move the offset how much blur, what color, and then we can do those effects. So I can use box shadow, because we've got the box model, to um, control this, which is plain old text at the beginning of the day, and now it looks like a graphical element with four CSS properties. Color, which is text color, background color, which is background color, width of the box, and box shadow on the box. So you'll just have to memorize background color obviously is background color, and color means text color. When they were inventing this, no one had the great idea to say, why don't we call it text color? No one had that great idea, or even font color. This is called color. And that specifies the font color, text color. Now the danger here, if you've taken any other HTML classes and such, the danger of using the most cutting edge and latest CSS3 code is that it's not compatible with older web browsers. Our version, I've got Firefox, and I've currently got um, Firefox, um, some version of Firefox. I've got Firefox 46. If you're using Chrome, that's also probably version 52 or something. We've got the latest versions of the web browsers, I believe. 52. We've got the latest ones. So our brand new CSS code works just fine. Older versions like Internet Explorer 7 or Firefox 10, or Chrome 2.0, Safari, you know, 1, or something. Those don't recognize this modern CSS code and it just ignores it. And oftentimes you hear about using vendor prefixes and all of this to say, let's make our drop shadow make sure that it works on every browser, on Microsoft's browser, on Apple's browser, on Google's browser. That'll just require writing more code. And that was very important five years ago or more when these, this new code was not universally adopted yet. Nowadays, I don't worry about it. I don't deal with vendor prefixes. 
I deal with the standard code, and if the browser can't handle it, it can't handle it. I'm not going to worry about it because eventually our project is going to go to a mobile device where Internet Explorer does not exist. Internet Explorer 7 does not exist. Where Google Chrome 2.0 does not exist. Where Safari 3 does not exist. So I'm not going to worry about vendor prefixes. It's just more code, more writing, more to maintain. And yes, we can use various frameworks to help us with that. But um, I'm going to say, if you know about that aspect of things, have at it. I'm not going to teach that. Not necessary in modern browsers. And yes, some people cannot get a modern browser, but this drop shadow, if it was something visually interesting and such, it should not be mission critical. It should not be that I need to make this design here for my project to work. It should be icing on the cake. So this looks nice, but if a person didn't have this ability, it would still say objectives. It just wouldn't look as nice. And that's what the important part is, that it delineates this as an objective. So we'll pause and take a little break here for the moment. We've been playing with some inline CSS. After the break, we will play with uh, embedded CSS. It's 710. We'll take a break till 720. If you need any help, call me over and we'll get started again at 720.